Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you have joined us either in person or online, and we trust that you'll be blessed by your presence with us today. Here in North America, this is Father's Day, and it is a tradition in our church to celebrate fathers on this day, both those who have been natural fathers raising their own kids and those who have acted as surrogate fathers, especially in our church those who taught our kids in Sunday school, those who chaperoned them in trips, those who played with them in VBS. We want to recognize all of them on this morning. We're also going to be sharing a Bible text about a man who played the role of a surrogate father to the Apostle Paul. His name is Ananias, and he took some amazing steps of faith in order to make that happen in this morning's text. None of it would have happened, though. Not one single bit without a compelling call from God. I'll be sharing much more about that story in a few minutes, but for now, I invite you to join me in the worship of a God who sent His Son to save us and draw each of us into the family of faith. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood, Thank you. 
may be seated. This time I invite the adults to press the friendship pads found next to the center aisle, recording your presence with us. And as it's passed back, if there's a new face on your row, speak up, say hello, let them know who you are. As you're doing that, I'll invite the children to come forward also as I have a very special word for them. Some of you might know this is actually a pretty special day in our country. And if you, yes, why? Um, it's you're right, it's Father's Day. Chance to celebrate the guys who act like fathers in our lives. Do any of you ever have a dad or granddad or friend who put you on their shoulder like that, carried you around? That's kind of fun when you're young. How about this one? Here's another one. And if you ever have somebody pull you like that one, that's kind of scary, but it's really fun too, swinging you around and around and around. How about this? Have you ever had a dad or granddad who did that? Taught you how to fish? Yeah, yeah that's kind of fun too, isn't it? Um, my dad actually didn't teach me to do a lot of those things because um, he worked really long hours, like 12 hours a day, and he got home really tired at night. And then on Saturdays, he usually felt the need to work in the yard so one of my early memories of dad is just like this, digging in the dirt, but he paid me for it. Guess what I got paid? A nickel an hour. Not too good, huh? Got to be a quarter by the time I was a team that pretty lousy. To be honest... Yeah, I think I should have got $100 too, but Dad didn't see it that way. Um, honestly, it wasn't always a lot of fun. Sometimes there's a lot of hard work. But, you know, I learned so many things from Dad. I learned how to tend the grass. I learned how to plant trees and shrubs. I learned when to water. I learned when to fertilize. So much stuff that has helped me as I've grown older in the, my life. So I'm grateful, even for those times that weren't always fun. Well, I started not much older than that, actually. I was probably about two or three. I did, wasn't much help in the garden, um, but I went all the way through high school working with my dad. Usually, that's kind of how it was. Now I'm a grown-up and I don't work. Well, I wish it was that way. <laughs> he has an interesting image of adulthood, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's not quite that way, but I, I probably don't spend as much time in the yard as my dad did. We had a great big yard growing up, I'll admit that. When my son looks back on my life and thinks about what I did, probably this is going to be one of his memories. We spent a lot of time on homework. You hate homework. So did he. And that's why we had to spend time together. <laughs> It wouldn't get done all by himself, especially math. He hated math. And so we spent a whole lot of time doing it. There's a, oh good, math is fun. He hates it. Well, that, that's just how it is a lot of times, one or the other. You love it? Yeah. It, it, math is really hot or cold kind of thing, just the way it is. You don't like to do all the writing, just to get the answer. Yeah, I know that story, too. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you have to do the writing, though, too. That's just part of it in math. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we spent a lot of time doing homework. And again, probably when Andrew looks back on this, it won't be a huge highlight of his life to have to do homework with Dad. But the good thing is he got through it. And I think when time comes and he's raising his own kids, he'll probably remember that and go, probably was a good thing. Probably was a good thing we did that after all. And the reason I mention all of this is that there's so many different kinds of dads out there, so many different kinds of families. You know, some of them do lots of sports, some don't. Some of them help with homework, some don't. And of course, some kids... Your mom goes to school, okay. Some kids don't have a dad in the home. That's just the way life is. It didn't work out that way. But the cool thing is, even if you don't have a dad in the home, when you are part of a church, there's all kinds of other guys who start to act like dads in all kinds of ways. Some, there are some guys, for example, who might teach you in sports. 
you know, either in, they could coach you in the church or in other places, maybe in the community. You join a team, there's a coach who helps you with sports, kind of acting like a dad. My dad used to coach me in baseball. Your dad used to coach you in baseball? That's cool. That's fun. You play soccer? You need a good coach for soccer too? Absolutely. There's some dads or some men uh, who teach us. Like in Sunday school, when you go to Sunday school, we've got a lot of men who teach Sunday school as well as women. So that's a really important role to play. Lots of guys do that in the church and in the larger world. And there are some people, this is my favorite part, there's some dads who just play with us. Like if you guys signed up, how many of you have signed up for Vacation Bible School? You need to sign up quick. You, need, you gotta sign up really quick. It's gonna be in July. It is so much fun. And the reason it's so much fun is there's lots of learning, but there's lots of play too. Lots of creative play. Guys and gals play with us, just have a good time. Usually get a little wet too in the hot days. Why would cows play with you? I think I meant guys and gals. That's probably what I meant. But anyway, (laughs) if you can get a cow to play with you, I would like to see that. Um, (laughs) Maybe so. But long and short of it, there's so many people who act kind of like dads. If you have a real dad in your home, that's awesome. If you don't have a dad in your home, you're part of a bigger family where lots of people step up to do that. And that's why in our church on Father's Day, we have a tradition. And the tradition is that we ask you guys to pass out candy bars to every single man in the church Because every single man here has a chance at some point to act kind of like a dad. There's a little tie we put on the front of it. It's a Mr. Good bar, actually, which is kind of cool. Put a little tie in the front of it. That's kind of cute. And we'll ask, how many baskets do we have? we got five baskets. So why don't you two guys take one and and every single dad you see. Okay, Miss Marnie will help with this too. So we don't get too much chocolate on the floor. (laughs) Good job. As they're passing out the very last of these, why don't we pray? Dear God, we are so grateful for those in our lives who have acted like dads. They've played with us. They've taught us. They've shown us how to work. They've done so many things to shape our lives. And God, we pray on this day that they would sense our gratitude and that you would work within us to continue that tradition with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Trusting in the promise of grace, let us tell the whole truth about ourselves and ask for God's mercy so our lives can be made new. Please stand and join me in the prayer of confession. O blessed and loving Redeemer, you taught us that you are the way, the truth, and the life. But we think that we already know the truth, and we want to go our own way. Through the power of your Spirit, open our hearts and minds to receive your life, learn your truth, and follow your path for our lives and for our community. As we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Rejoice and be glad. Our God is full of mercy, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. What a beautiful Father's Day to be in worship together.
One way in which we celebrate the amazing grace of God is by spending some time in celebration with each other, and we will have a great opportunity to do that at the Summer Picnic on Sunday, July the 3rd at 4 p.m. It's not just the food. There's usually some games and other activities involved, and it's just a great way to get to know one another better. So we hope you will sign up after church today to be a part of that. If you haven't done so, I also hope you will sign up 
uh, yourself, your kids, and grandkids for Vacation Bible School, because some of our classes are already filling up. We've got like more than 60 kids, most of them from elsewhere. I don't want ours to be squeezed out. So if you have a child or grandchild who might be available to end that week, be sure to bring them. It is such a highlight. So much fun, so much learning, so much music, so much joy. I know you'll, they'll really want to be a part of that, and I hope some of you adults will want to be a part of that as well. Another opportunity we have coming up this summer is special music. Beginning next week and continuing through the month of July, there's special music that's involved, you know, solos, various instruments, whatever. Uh, we're giving the choir a well-deserved break. They have earned it in the last nine months, and um, we are filling in with other opportunities. So if you know someone who might want to be part of that, or if you might want to be part of that, just let us know. Finally, um, we did receive a number of new members in May, but some of you were not there that Sunday, so we did print out bios for them. It's in the Narthex. You can pick that up on your way home, get to know some of the other folks who have decided to affiliate with our church. Moving on to prayer concerns, I hope you will remember Jadira Kailama, who was hospitalized yesterday. Bless her heart, she came to Roos Memorial, said she couldn't miss it, went straight from there to ER because she was in so much pain. Um, they did find a reason for it. Her potassium levels were low. That's treatable, and we're glad it's treatable, but we pray that the doctors would, would be able to do exactly the right thing to help her out in the challenges that she has recently faced. Uh, very glad to see Ted here today, looking a little bruised. It's not because he got beaten. <laughs> But then Suzanne's been tempted sometimes. <laughs> it's because he had eye surgery, but evidently healing up okay. Glad to see you with us. Kathy Nelson asks us to pray for Harold Nelson, her brother-in-law, uh, who uh, will be undergoing some cancer treatment soon. And Dave Redmond asks us to pray for his sister Charlotte, or Dave Crowder, rather, asks us to pray for his sister Charlotte, who broke her hip and is recovering from surgery. I'm very glad to report that John Dricker has been released from the hospital. Surgery went well, there was a little drama after that, but seem, things seem to be settling down. And uh, I'm also glad to report that it was just a beautiful memorial service on Friday for Ruth Brandt. I think her family was touched and so many sweet memories kindled of her time with us, especially in her Stevens ministry. What a remarkable woman she was. We will be, uh, we're glad to have spent that time remembering her, and we will be glad also this week to remember Pat Nordstrom, who has been such a huge part of Vacation Bible Schools, of our mission committee, of our quilting group. Just a remarkable woman and a woman of terrific faith. Um, Ken tells us that he wants all of you to come, but there is just one rule. No black. No black. We are celebrating the faith she had, the faith we have in God. And so we hope that you can join us for that on Saturday. Um, sorry to report that Anna Mae Ackerman did pass away this week. Wasn't unexpected, but I'm sure it's a tense time or an emotional time for her family. We'll be remembering her life in August, and we'll be remembering Jean Rohrabau's life in the week after vacation Bible school. So with all those thoughts in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for your healing touch in our lives and world. We've known so many people who recuperated from surgeries and challenges and trauma, partially at least through faith in you and also through the support of our larger community. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a part of that. We're also grateful for those who have completed their journey through life and have left such a tremendous legacy of joy and faith and strength to us as we celebrate what they did. God, we pray that you would continue to work in us to carry forward that legacy into the lives of others. We pray for all those who will be undergoing medical treatment in the weeks to come. Bless them, heal them, draw them to yourself. 
We pray for all those who will be traveling in these summer months. Protect them. Surround them with your shield of grace. And we pray for all the new opportunities that might be springing up both in the church and in the world. Help us choose wisely that we might experience renewal and bring that gift to others. Finally, God, we pray that throughout these summer months, your Holy Spirit would be at work touching us, shaping us, guiding us in the ways of Jesus Christ. For it is he who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. God, we are so grateful for those whom you have called to act like fathers in our lives. 
teachers, coaches, mentors, friends at church and work. It's hard to imagine how life would have been without their guidance and their call. So God, as we gather here to celebrate all fathers, both natural and surrogate fathers, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work within us, that you'd speak to us through the Scriptures, that you would reveal to us the way we should respond to your call to love and serve others. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned at the start of worship, today's Bible passage is really one of the most amazing and dramatic texts in all of Scripture, but none of it would have happened. Not one bit of it would have happened without one man named Ananias who chose to become a father to a very dangerous human being. So listen now for the Word of God to you. But Saul, still snorting with threats and murder for the disciples of the Lord, came to the high priest, asking him for letters of referral to the synagogues of Damascus, recommending that anyone found belonging to the way, both men and women, be bound and taken to Jerusalem. Three words are key here. One, snorting. So colorful in Greek, almost like an, you know, a a mule or almost like a bull about to charge, snorting with threats and murder, totally running on emotions here. Second key word, women. That was the first. Men had been persecuted before this, but not women. It was a new low for the church. Third key word, way. Belonging to the way. There were no Christians then. That word did not exist no Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists. There were only people who saw in Jesus a way to God, a way to salvation. Luke does a lot with that word later on. As he was traveling close to Damascus, a blaring light from heaven beamed all around him. Falling to the earth, he heard a voice speaking to him. Saul, Saul, why are you stalking me? Saul said, who are you? Lord, the voice replied, I am Jesus who you are stalking. Now stand up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Two key words here, one, stalking, usually translated persecuting. But the Greek word, and it, it's not just those who, you know, give you grief in a, in a cell or something. It's people who go after you, people who pursue you, who hound you, who are intense, that's the coloring of the phrase here. So it wouldn't be just like, with Jesus' case, it wouldn't be just the soldiers who put the crown of thorns on his head. It would be the crowds who were shouting for his execution, the people who were kicking and spitting at him along the way, all of those who hounded him in some sense. That's the flavor of the word in Greek. The second key word, go. You might have been in charge before. You might have been stalking. You might have been doing all sorts of wretched things. But that's about to change. Go. Stand up and go. You're not in charge anymore. I'll tell you what you must do. Those traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. After Saul was lifted from the ground, his eyes were opened, but he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind while eating and drinking nothing. Keywords here, one, nothing. They saw nothing. They heard the voice but saw nothing. When Paul's listed from the ground, he sees nothing at all. He is now blind. He also eats nothing. As a good and pious Jew, even though he is horribly misguided here, he's probably fasting to regain his sight. Second key word, hand, led by the hand. Luke wants to emphasize his helplessness. 
just as a father might lead a little baby or a little child by the hand. So Paul, this incredible, awesome, fierce fighting man, is now led helplessly by the hand, just like a toddler would be. Such an amazing reversal here. But there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord appeared to him in a vision, saying, Ananias. He said, I see you, Lord. The Lord said, Get up and travel along the road called Straight, seeking the house of Judas. Look for a man named Saul of Tarsus, for he is praying. He has seen a vision where a man named Ananias came in and placed his hands upon him so that he might regain his sight. The word here, vision. Two men have visions here. One, a follower of Christ. One, an enemy of Christ. The Christ appears to them both. One, the blinded man has this vision that he will be healed. The other, the sighted man has a vision that he must do the healing, even at great danger to himself. Another key word is straight. The road called straight. Have you ever been in ancient cities? You know there aren't many straight streets. They wander, they meander everywhere. To be on the straight street is to be on the highway, the king's highway where the prosperous people lived. You don't sneak into a house on straight street. Just knocking at the door might put you at some risk. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man and the evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Now he has authority from the high priests to arrest all of those who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, he is the vessel I have chosen to bear my name before the nations, even kings and sons of Israel. I will reveal to him how much he must suffer on behalf of my name. Three words key here. First, bear. He will bear my name just like a vessel, just like a box contains liquid or gold, perhaps a, a, an enameled on, name on the outside. So that's what Paul will be. He will be God's vessel bringing his name into the world. The next word is suffer, pasco in Greek. We often talk about Jesus' passion or suffering during the months of Lent. Here, God is saying, Paul will experience that. He'll know what it is to suffer, to experience passion and affliction in that sense. And the last key word is name. Again, they didn't have elaborate theology then, didn't have doctrines and creeds and dogmas. The only thing they really had was Jesus' name. Bearing my name will bring suffering. That's all that it would take back in those days. So Ananias departed. After entering the house and laying hands upon him, Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the way by which you came, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Earlier I mentioned that Christians were known as people of the way. Here, Paul, there's a reference to Paul having on the way that you came to persecute us, cause us grief, you met another person who's going to change your ways. Luke has lots of fun with that word. The second emphasis is spirit, the Holy Spirit, who falls actually in this case with no profession of faith. He just says, You'll regain your sight. You'll receive the Holy Spirit, even though you don't know a bloody thing about what this is all about. That's actually typical in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is crazy. He's unpredictable. He's unbounded. Does all kinds of things we don't expect. Holy Spirit is sort of like a wild card in the book of Acts, reminding us that God himself is unbounded, not contained by what we think should be correct. Immediately, something like flakes fell from his eyes, and he could see. Then he stood up and got baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength and spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. 
second key word is scales, maybe cataracts, something like that, flakes falling from the eyes. We can just sort of speculate about that. The second key word, strength. Paul does so much in his writings about strength. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Great verse from Philippians. That process starts here with the taking of food, but this is just the beginning of a journey that will bring renewed strength and challenge for many years. Almost immediately, Saul began to preach in the synagogues, proclaiming that Jesus is God's son. All who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the one who ransacked Jerusalem for all of those who called upon his name? And he did not come here to have them bound and led them to the chief priests? But Saul grew even stronger, confounding the Jews who were living in Damascus by showing that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, this is just one of the most astonishing texts in Scripture. I think I could preach it every year. Reminds me in some ways of the Christmas story when those shepherds are suddenly surrounded by a dazzling light. Same thing happens here. And in both cases, their paths are redirected. The shepherds are redirected to the manger in Bethlehem. And Paul is redirected to this house in Damascus where so many important changes will occur. Most important change, of course, is that this enemy of Christ become Christ's greatest advocate, a truly unstoppable missionary of faith. But how that happens It's really quite astonishing and profound. As I said at the very beginning of the text, without Ananias, this one man who at great risk brought the faith of Christ to him, none of that would have happened. Not one bit of it would occur. Of course, I'm not Ananias, neither are you. And even for those of us, perhaps, who are a little more timid, a little more uncertain about our faith, I think there's some really important things that we can glean from this morning's text. One of them is simply this, perhaps one of the most compelling ones. After all, when God's people are attacked, Jesus feels attacked. Now, there should be some reassurance in that. Jesus doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the Christians? Why are you persecuting my disciples? Why are you persecuting these people who believe these things? He says, why are you stalking me? The connection is that tight, that intimate. When you are attacked, when you are harangued, when you are unsettled unfairly by people who are vicious in some way, Jesus feels it. Jesus knows it. He takes it personally in some sense. I think it's appropriate this text occurs on Father's Day because that was my experience as a dad. When Andrew came home from school demoralized or beaten or bruised or downcast, it really bugged me, really bugged me. Another kid did it, I wanted to pound him. (laughs) You can't do it, of course, (laughs) and I didn't. But that's how I felt. I felt so riled up for my kid, so determined to make things better, to make things right when I could. According to this morning's text, That's how Jesus feels about us. When you hurt, he hurts. When you cry, he cries. When you scream, he screams. The connection is that intimate, that strong. That's the first thing we need to glean, I think, from this morning's text. Here's the second one. The way that Christ responds to these attacks It's often very different from our own. Again, 
If I was in charge in Damascus and I knew that Saul was doing these things, I'd want to get him arrested. I'd want to get him punished. I'd want to get him thrown in jail. I'd want to get him stopped. There's all kinds of things I'd want to do by force. And of course, God's voice is forceful here. What God really wants to do is not to take Saul out, but to bring Saul in to the family of faith. Their greatest enemy, their greatest threat, not to be eliminated, but to be redeemed. Remember how Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. The word persecute is the same one as stalked in this morning's text. That's how Jesus wants us to proceed. That's how Jesus wants us to behave. But it's so counterintuitive. So difficult to do. To pray, to passionately pray for those whom you think are causing harm. The head of the prayer tree in my last church, every single week now for about three months, has included Vladimir Putin. And I can hardly get the word out. I want to spit. But I know he's right. He's absolutely right. Right. That's what God calls for us to do. I don't know that Putin will be changed. I don't know that he'll be redeemed. I'm, I don't know if my faith is quite that big, honestly. But I know it's possible. I know it can occur because it already has. With Saul who would become Paul, God's greatest enemy, becomes God's greatest advocate in the end. So the way that Christ responds to attack is often very, very different than our own. But, third point perhaps most important, when we choose to follow, to act upon Christ's words, amazing things occur. Truly amazing things can occur. Lives can be changed. The world can be redeemed. I've known so many missionaries through the years who talked about that. When the chief of the village who wanted to do them in actually comes to see them for who they are. So many things are changed. So many lives can be redeemed. In preparing this sermon, I was particularly reminded of a man named Kifa Sempongi. Kifa was an evangelical pastor of a very large church in Uganda during the reign of Idi Amin. Initially, during Amin's reign, Things were not that bad. He was trained in Britain. He followed British protocols, British rule. But eventually power came, got to his head. Wanted more and more of it. Wanted to eliminate others who got in the way. And then eventually syphilis got into his head. And that's when things really got crazy and bizarre. You never knew who was going to be taken out. Um, Sampagi thought he was safe because he didn't talk about politics. He was really careful about that. He just talked about Jesus and the church. But lots of people followed him. Lots of people asked him about it privately. Lots of people counseled with him. And so one Sunday, one Easter Sunday, shortly after church, he was gathering in his office, and four soldiers showed up to say, this is your last Sunday. By the time we leave, 
you'll be dead. Any last things you want to say? (laughs) I think they expected him to beg. Beg for his life, beg for his family, beg for mercy, to question, why are you doing this? I'm not a bad guy. You know, all those other things. Instead, Sampongi said, actually, there's just one thing I want to do. I want to pray for you. Those who were holding the guns, those who were just about to do him in. And he did. He prayed that God would forgive him. Even though he knew that they clearly were deserving hell. And as African pastors often do, he made it long. (laughs) Mentioning their families and his families and their future and his past. But again, focusing the prayer entirely on them. God, work in them. Change them. And when he finally opened his eyes at the end, ready to receive a bullet, he saw an empty room. All four of them had left while he prayed. It was an Easter like no other. (laughs) But it was an Easter that began with his obedience to Christ's words. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. When we do that, so many things are changed. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, Thank you for this morning's Bible text. The astonishing message it proclaims. And the unwavering challenge that it brings to us. Each one of us. When we're tempted to cower in fear. When we're tempted to scream with hate. When we're tempted to be so much less than you created us to be. Help us to remember this morning's text. And help us, God, like Ananias, to respond to it in faith. That the love of Jesus might be revealed anew And that the hate that cripples this world in so many ways might finally be redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen.
My friends, the good news of the gospel is that we have a power, an amazing power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A power that is able to turn enemies to friends. You have been entrusted with that. To bear it to the world. So go forth with God's blessing to bless the lives of others. Remembering that Christ walks with you. Amen.